<laughs> Those little alien comics. They do normal human things, but describe them in funny ways. Strange planet indeed. I feel like I'm missing something. Like there was something I was supposed to be doing, or is there anything happening? Something important, or uh... Wait, Taylor Swift dropped a new single? A month ago? What, what, what happened to the Todd alarm? It's supposed to be notified immediately when something like this happens. Well, I, I gotta review it. Let me hear it. Let me hear the goddamn song. Yeah, that can wait. Eh, I guess I'm not doing anything. I have spent so much time in my life thinking about Taylor Swift as an artist, as a public personality, as a phenomenon. There are very few people alive who've captured the public's imagination like she has, and definitely no one who's had a career arc like she has. No one has evolved like her, no one has commanded attention like her, no one will ever be Taylor Swift like Taylor Swift. I actually only really love a small handful of her songs, but I still would absolutely call her one of the greatest pop stars of our time. And to underline my point about how iconic she is, check out that last album, cause it sucks. It's just straight not good. And yet she got a lot of mileage out of it. It was the top selling album of last year. Only Taylor Swift could have gotten anything out of an album that misconceived. But if you power a bad project no one likes to success just off of hype and name recognition, it does catch up with you. Cracks were starting to show. The singles underperformed. It could be that Taylor reached the rarefied air of Beyonce or Kanye where she doesn't even need hits anymore, but I don't think that she's there yet. And so, listening to this new single, my question is, is the Taylor Swift moment over? I promise that you'll never find another like me. After a long tease, Taylor Swift dropped Me, the lead-off single to her newest, as yet unnamed album. And just like every other leadoff single of hers, it immediately shot to the top of the charts because Taylor Swift owns that number one spot. It's her goddamn birthright. Except. I got the horses in the bag. Okay, so it didn't get the number one spot. Yeah, it was held off by Old Town Road, which has been cock blocking all contenders for the spot for months. Which, you know what? Fine. Old Town Road is one of those bizarre flukes that came from a perfect storm of different trends. It's a once in a lifetime phenomenon that we will never see again. No one's beating that. So that doesn't say anything bad about Taylor. Well, there's no shame in being beaten by the best. But he didn't seem all that- We were beaten by the best, boy. So no big. It doesn't mean anything that it's only a number two hit this time. Or three. Or, oh geez, this baby's dropping. That's, uh, that's not good. Yeah, 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 I know. For anyone else, four weeks in the top ten would be amazing. But Taylor Swift isn't anybody. She was the biggest pop star in the world for the last five years. If it's not absolutely huge, it's a failure. And this is not looking huge. So what's going wrong here? Well, let's check out the song itself. Promise that you'll never find another like me. Taylor Swift was teasing its release for like a month leading up to it. So a song like this, announced with this much fanfare, has to make a big splash. Now I've talked about this kind of song before, but I never gave it a pithy name, so here we go. We're gonna call this the I'm Back Bitch single. It's Britney, bitch. Now a good I'm Back Bitch single has three major qualities. One, it is by the most famous person in the world. Because I'm bad, I'm bad. The earliest example I can think of comes from the late King of Pop, may he... Well, we're still not going to go there. But he pioneered the I'm Back Bitch single because he had to follow up the biggest album in history. It's a kind of song that only works if it's going to attract tons of attention just because of the person releasing it. Two, it is the start of a new album cycle. Guess who's back, 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 back again. 
you have to be reintroducing yourself to the public so that you can drop your new project. And the momentum from the lead single has to carry the entire record. And three, it has to be about absolutely nothing. Gotta get, get boom, 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 gotta get, get boom. It has to be a colossally empty song with no message or topic whatsoever, except, of course, how great the artist is. It only exists to reaffirm that this superstar is still the biggest fucking thing in the universe, and they're gonna continue to stomp ass like Godzilla through Tokyo. Now this is a high risk, high reward approach. Now if it works, it can turn a star into an icon. But if it flops, or even slightly underperforms, it can throw an entire career into question. Like, it was supposed to prove how great you were, and it failed, I guess you weren't as important as we thought you were. Now, I would not say that Taylor Swift has ever released a song like that, which is weird to say because all of Taylor's lead-off singles have been huge. They've been these big explosive grenades that shocked the pop world. Each and every time when she's dropped a new single for a new album, I've gotten up in front of this camera and just lost my shit. Taylor's rapping? What? Oh, look what you made me do. Blah. Yeah, I feel a little silly about myself now. Those are all perfectly normal pop songs in hindsight. Well, look what you made me do still kind of floors me. But the reason why those songs shocked me so much at the time is that they were so radically different from where she started. She used to be this sweet little girl with a guitar who wasn't very flashy and didn't seem particularly sophisticated. And each new album since 2012 has pushed her further and further from the image we'd had of her. And it looks like her new single is supposed to do that as well. Another leap forward. You can tell because of the intro. See, the snake was the symbol of new, evil, bad girl Taylor. And poof, Dark Taylor can't come to the phone right now. Why? Cause she's butterflies. Know that I'm a handful, baby. Uh. And so, at last, we have a true I'm back bitch single from Taylor. That's right. And I know what you're thinking. What makes the other singles not that kind of single? And the answer is, they were all about something. I'm really gonna miss you picking fights. I mean, yeah, they did all affirm Taylor's superiority in some kind of way, but they all had a point or a theme. They all had a story they were telling about an awful on-off relationship, or her brushing off her haters, or transforming into a vengeful goddess queen. A true I'm back bitch single shouldn't worry about things like other people. It should only be about the artist exclusively. So is it, is it only about herself? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I can only speculate, but early indications are good. I promise that you'll never find another like me. Yes, yes, the song titled Me is in fact all about her. I know that I would psycho on the phone. More specifically, it's about how, yes, yeah, she's crazy and a mess, but that's what makes her so much fun. I'm the only one of me. Baby, that's the fun of me. I'll give it this, one of me and fun of me is a great rhyme. And for as much shit as I gave that last album, I'll say this for it. It finally got Taylor to stop thinking of herself as the underdog. I mean, releasing a song called Me is a dangerous move for someone who's already perceived as an egotist who's far up her own ass. But compared to Shake It Off, where she's still in denial about who the hell she is? No, I'll take this attitude any day of the week. Gonna follow where I go. So, what's going wrong here? Why is this not doing well? And more importantly, why am I not shocked and blubbering incoherently like I usually am with Taylor? I mean, this is a horrifying pastel nightmare. Shouldn't I be scandalized at this crime against good taste? Why is my monocle still firmly in my eye? Well, my first problem is this. It's not a huge leap forward. It's presenting itself like it is, what with the, the big new branding and the butterflies and all, but it's not. It's a step backwards. Every previous album was playing off her original image as an innocent, willowy teenage folk singer. But with Reputation, we took that hard turn into pop just as far as we could go. We hit the wall. Who even remembers that she played guitar? The old Taylor's dead, remember? There's nothing left of her to kill. So this sound is basically a retreat. She could have made this at any point since she went pop. Like, look at this skit at the beginning. Vraiment trop. 
Comment oses-tu? Calme-toi, s'il te plaît. Je suis calme! Uh huh, she's crazy and dramatic. I've seen this. So it's gonna be forever. In fact, the song itself is basically just the reversal of blank space. You know, it's, you know, instead of I look nice, but I'm crazy, it's I seem crazy, but it's fun. She's basically saying she's sweet, but psycho. <laughs> kind of embarrassing that a song about the same topic by a complete no-name is about to overtake her. So anyway, that explains why it's not shocking or groundbreaking, but the bigger problem is just the sound itself. See, I forgot to mention the other major important thing about the I'm Back Bitch single. It has to sound humongous. They should steamroll you. You should feel actively bullied by it. Cause it's not gonna get you on substance. Remember, about nothing. Nothing. That's something all her other lead singles understood. But this isn't colossal sounding. It's sweet and pleasant. But not sweet and pleasant enough to leave any lingering aftertaste. It certainly doesn't match the video, which is expensive looking and horrifying. It's trying to tell me that I'm listening to a cloying bubblegum monstrosity, but I'm clearly not. If you're gonna go bubblegum, go bubblegum. There should be so much bubblegum you should choke on it. Willy Wonka should be offended by it. And I can think of songs like that. Dream Lover by Mariah Carey. Sugar Baby Love by The Rubettes. Barbie Girl by Aqua. Definitely not this. But there is one thing that does make this song stand out from her previous work. There's a guy on it. No, I tend to make it about me. Taylor doesn't do a lot of collaborations. And every time she does do a duet, it freaks me out a little. Mostly because I expect her to break up with them before the end of the song. But yeah, apparently she wasn't confident of the song's potential as a solo feature, so she brought in a ringer. Kind of. Promise that you'll never find another like me. Yes, Brendan Urie of Panic at the Disco. Who we must only refer to as Brendan Urie of Panic at the Disco, judging by all the labeling of this song. Brendan Urie of Panic at the Disco. Brendan Urie is Panic at the Disco. Panic was one of the big emo bands of the 2000s. They didn't really have any big pop hits after that first album, but their fandom never got any less intense. Those guys are nuts. And that's an impressive feat considering all their internal drama. Half the band left after their second album, including their main songwriter, and the last remaining other member left two years ago, so it's essentially a solo project now. But somehow Yuri has kept the band going, and he brought it back to prominence last year with a big comeback hit, High Hopes. I was always a pretty big fan of Panic. I really liked Death of a Bachelor, their album from 2016. But this new song, I'm sorry, High Hopes is crappity crap crap crap. Plays a little better on the album, which is Yuri's full dive into pop mania, and it is. Uh, I hate the phrase hot mess, so let's call it a flaming shambles. A feverous wreckage. I actually kind of like it despite myself because it's so ridiculous, but High Hopes is easily the most boring, worst sounding song on the record. So I guess I see why Taylor snagged him for this similarly cheap and shitty sounding song. I didn't want to believe it, but after observing that last album and now this, it's undeniable. Brendan Urie is undergoing what I can only call a full Adam Levineization. And I can hear the panic diehards, even the ones who hate the new sound, being all like, well, that's not fair, he's not that bad. Yet. Payphone wasn't the worst song either. But the direction was clear. And look, Levine is on his way out. Someone's gotta fill that void and cash those checks. Cha-ching. But Yuri's move towards bland selloutism might stop right here, cause he sure doesn't do anything for this song. He's not a strong enough presence to be a match for Taylor. He doesn't have the star power, as indicated by how they have to keep reminding you who he is. And maybe he was picked so he wouldn't overshadow Taylor, but it makes for an unbalanced duet. Plus they have no chemistry. I don't think Taylor's ever had chemistry with anyone. And even if they did, just his very presence, or anyone's presence, would be wrong. The name of the song is Me. If Taylor's gonna write a song called Me, that's who it should be about. There shouldn't be anyone else on it. It just seems like a song that doesn't know what it's doing. I just see no surprises in it. Hey kids, spelling is fun. Actually, hold up, what? Hey kids, spelling is fun. Girl, there ain't no I in T. But you know there is a me. Strike the band of one, two, three. What the? Oh, 
I know what this is trying to be. It all makes sense now. The marching band beat, spelling, except for not being a leadoff single, this is a perfect example of the effect Taylor's trying to achieve. You know, I don't know if I've ever told y'all this, but I really love Hollaback Girl. I mean, it does not work at all, but it blew my mind. At the time, I thought it was the craziest thing a major pop star had ever dared to release for mass consumption. And even though I hated that awful cheerleader rap from Shake It Off, it operated in much the same way. Sometimes, being obnoxious works. If you're annoying, that means you caught people's attention. It's a start. But this is... I mean, what are we even doing? Girl, there ain't no ING. When Stefani's shit being bananas was not something I'd ever heard before. This is something I absolutely have heard before. There's a me and team. I think that was a joke I heard on Nickelodeon when I was in the sixth grade. What does it even have to do with anything? Who was talking about being a team? The whole spelling is fun thing should be the lead up to something either crazy or mind meltingly awful. He can't spell awesome me. But there's nothing special or interesting about it. These are slogans I'd see on a bumper sticker at Spencer's Gifts. She's not even spelling anything. I guess that's the problem with the entire song. Instead of, I'm back, bitch, this is, well, I guess I'm back, or something. This was a moment in her career where she needed to make a big splash, and instead she played it safe. It's trying to be campy and cute, but it's not campy and cute enough to be any fun. It just sounds like the Glee version of itself. I'm not saying her career's over or anything. Maybe that new album will be packed with hits. But this is starting to become a really alarming pattern. I shouldn't be able to mistake a Taylor Swift song for a Megan Trainor song. That's a really bad sign. For a song that's supposed to be a celebration of all things Taylor, it feels like a total letdown in all regards, and like a goodbye to the days when Taylor Swift could command attention just by existing. Think spelling is fun? Well, here's a letter for you. D. Maybe even D minus. Good luck with the rest of the album. Nobody's gonna love you like me. Me, 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 me.